Uh, but it's nice to meet everybody. My name is Chris Westerhold. I am currently the head of developer experience for ThoughtWorks. And, but here at the end of the month, I am going to be changing positions and I'm going to work for DX and I'm going to be helping them start a kind of strategic consulting group. And I also have a, um, another adventure called Think Big Code Small where we have a podcast and blog and all kinds of interesting other content that we put together. So enough about me. Let's chat about all of the fun stuff this today. So let's start with a kind of an interesting quote from Deming, talking about the systems that people work with and how they really make up 90 to 95% of the performance of that individual person. So regardless of how good or how talented that person might be, the system that they're in is really going to dictate how well they actually can achieve or not achieve inside of that ecosystem. And, you know, for anybody that's known me for a while, I'm a huge F1 fan. And I think F1 does a, a really good example of showing this. Like, who actually, you know, who does more work in an F1 team? Is it the driver or is it the, the team surrounding them? The, the driver tends to get a lot of the accolades for all the wins and those types of things, but you know, as our dear Steak F1 fans would know, a 50 second pit stop is not going to win you a race. And, you know, so if you think about it, you know, you have all of these different systems. They have the pit stops, they have, you know, the, the, the car setup, you have all of the different car design and all of those kinds of things that go into it are all done before a driver ever steps in. And those systems are really predicated on how well they can actually achieve and what they can do as they move forward. So. You know, if we think about that and move that into a kind of an ecosystem inside of, an, of a typical kind of engineering organization, you have a ton of these different platforms and systems all across your ecosystem. And, you know, one of the interesting things that, you know, I kind of hear from people a lot is, oh, we don't have a platform for that, or we don't really have a process for this. Yeah, you do, actually. Whether you know that you did it on purpose or not, there is a process for people to be able to solve lots of these different challenges inside of your organization. If you know, something as simple as kind of infrastructure, there might not be an easy way to get that infrastructure, or there could be a really complex way. And what I see a lot, of, a lot in a lot of these big organizations is you know, ticket-based systems, you have long wait times, you have, you know, well, my, my favorite is these cloud intake forms that I see pop up quite a bit. My favorite recently was with a, a large insurance company and there was 125 questions you had to answer to get your cloud infrastructure set up for a new application. How, take a quick guess, how long do you think, what is the average time that it took to get something into production at that company? Any guesses? Very close, 189 days was the average. Very, and so if you think about you know, that taking 189 days to create something and to actually get that into production, it's because you haven't thought at all about the platforms that are there. Whether, you know, just, just look at some of these. So your governance platform. You know, how do you actually handle your governance? You know, a lot of people, they have stacks and stacks and stacks of PDFs that do almost nothing. Really, in the end, if you think about a data breach or some kind of governance problem, it's doing almost nothing for you. Um, but, you know, at the end of the year, you, we all get to go and spend a day or, you know, taking an online quiz that says that I know how to, how to handle governance at my office and check the box. But if you start to think about those things in more of a modern way, you can use things like OPA and lots of these other kind of, you know, kind of policy as code engines to be able to enforce some of those things in real time. But, that is not the reason why we're here, though I could talk about that topic as well. But so what are some of the costs of these bad systems? So, you know, I, I, this is a little bit outdated. This is from 2018, but I was a bit surprised to find that there's between 18 and 25 million developers across the world. And, you know, having anywhere between, you know, 900 billion and trillion and a half dollars of GDP created by that, which is interesting. But if you look at the loss that's created, around $300 billion in loss every year comes from um, really developer inefficiency. And if you take that number, I've seen, I've seen numbers as, as high as you know, 35 million, but I think that's a little bit of a stretch. But 300 to $500 billion every year is, is spent wasted 
on poor developer experience. So, okay, all right. So, where does it all go? <laughs> like, you know, I talked to an awful lot of kind of CIOs and, and executives, and they they just cannot seem to figure out where all of this goes. They do all of this planning. They put everything together. They've, you know, they have a three-month plan. They have a six-month plan. They've got their quarterly planning done. Everything looks like it's all great, but you know, a lot of the things that they don't consider is a lot of these other challenges that you can see. And again, you know, that 30% value add, but what you really should be thinking about is more 65, 60% value add. And people spend a lot of time trying to find information, waiting for feedback loops, just developer experience friction overall. And it's a huge challenge. And really, in the end, you should be able to expect that, but it takes a lot of effort. So what do a lot of people do next? It's like, oh, I've realized that I'm highly, highly inefficient. And so what do I need to do? And they'll start to gather metrics. And they'll gather, some of them gather lots and lots of metrics. Some of them gather a little bit. But they'll start to, they'll start to think about these metrics and those kinds of things. And, and you know, one of the key challenges to a lot of this is having a really solid metric space. And they're, they're, they're not wrong, but they will go and grab the door metrics. Yay. The Dora metrics are interesting in some ways, but I would, I would say that they are wholly inefficient to run an engineering organization. So, you know, what does a deployment frequency of three days actually mean? Is that good? Is it bad? I can make a case that, that both of those are good and or bad, depending on exactly what situation you're in. Like, did you used to deploy once a year? And if you did, great, every three days is amazing. But if you're a highly, you know, kind of elite, elite level organization that should be deploying multiple times a day and you're deploying every three days, there's a serious problem that you need to really circle the wagons to, to figure out what the issue is. But the other challenge that I see is people then go and build a whole bunch of fancy dashboards. And you know, what, what is the challenge with some of that is you're having to predict the future. So I now have a, I now have a dashboard that shows me these four metrics. And you know, they change, they move, they go up and down, but in the end they're directional at best and useless at worst. And, you know, to go back to that same insurance company I was talking about before, when I first got there, I showed up and they were very quick to pull up their nice Dora dashboard that showed me almost every one of their teams was elite. And I was like, wow, that's great. And that's really great. Then why am I here? If you've already solved the problem, why am I here? And you know, as we started to dig in, well, we got to the 189 days pretty quickly. And to, to dig a little bit deeper into that, they had about a 48% uh, pipeline failure rate. So, okay, if you, if you have these metrics and somehow 48% of your, of your pipelines are failing, then how is that not in these metrics and how have you not noticed that? And the even funnier problem to the, 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 the root cause of that they, they decided to, to stand up SonarCube, and, which is a great tool and if you do it, but you have to configure it. And they didn't configure it at all. They literally just took the thing that was there and they put it in and, and they didn't teach anybody how to use it. And a lot of the configurations people were putting in just broke it. But then everybody figured out that if you just run the pipeline twice, it works. It forgets the, the configuration. Somehow it just magically works. And so they were not only <laughs> lying to themselves about their metrics, they were also almost doubling, or at least 25% more, 50% more of their pipeline costs, build times, waiting, all of these things are just going wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong. But, so, you know, there's all of these challenges with these metrics, but when you actually start to look at the other root of the problem for a lot of these developer experience issues, what are the things that, you know, if you actually ask your developers, what are the things that they're actually spending their time on? And this came from a, um, a GitHub blog, I believe. I forgot to put the link in here, but if anybody's interested, I'll send it to you. 27% um, of people said they spent the most of their day waiting for builds. And like, okay, well, that's a problem. But that also has secondary problems. So if you're sitting there waiting for your build, what are you going to do? You're probably going to start more stuff at, at best is, oh, grab more work, and I can do this while um, I'm waiting. At worst, you're going to go bother your buddy. 
and start to talk to them while your build's building. So now you're wasting your time waiting for long builds and you're wasting your, your you know, person sitting across the desk from you or whatever, that's just one Slack message away of wasting their time. And so when you start to you know, look at that you know, 300 billion or a lot of these smaller, like these other ones, it becomes really apparent how, uh, how fast we can waste money. Another one of these is you know, code reviews. Like code reviews can take two, three, four, five days in some places. And you know, again, what are you gonna do? Same kind of problems. And the bottom one's my favorite, filling out timesheets. 25% of people said that's the thing they spend the most of their day on. You know, I've, I've seen some people that are tracking time down to the my, most minute detail. And I will just sit there and ask them, like, why do you want this information? And what are you actually trying to get from this? Like, you know, everybody loves to be micromanaged. And do you think micro measurement is any different than micromanagement? And then they'll look at you like, oh, well, I never really thought about it that way. Like, well, maybe you should. You know, so why is there such this disconnect? And I would say that one of the biggest reasons is that what everybody wants to focus on right now is developer productivity. Nobody really wants to think about everything on the left. That's the hard stuff. I wanna just focus on developer productivity and try to get people to move faster. You know, if I could give them just little, little jets for their fingers, or they can just type faster. They'd be better. But one of the things that that actually ignores is the fact that only 35-ish percent of a developer's time is actually spent writing code. Most of the time is actually spent solving challenges, understanding business logic, writing, you know, just figuring out all the stuff that goes along with it. And you know, even if they were typing quite a bit faster, they're still gonna struggle to get their job done. Another interesting um, stat is around 70% of, of developers feel burnt out, yet they code on the weekends. Why is that? It's not because of their board of type, their board of coding. They actually really love coding. It's the organizational nonsense that comes over it. And you know, a lot of people think we just kind of need a faster horse. So from a you know, developer productivity, again, if I could just get them to type faster, they'd be better. You know, if you go back to the early 1900s when we were going through the auto, like the auto revolution, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of people that were arguing that, you know, we don't need cars, we just need faster horses. But they were really ignoring the problem. What we really needed is better ways of putting out fires. We needed better ways of creating infrastructure. We needed to be able to create better cities, all of those kinds of things. And a faster horse doesn't help you with that. And honestly, I think the same thing really applies to the software development world. And so when you think about, you know, everybody wants to, again, talk about that developer productivity, but the hard part's really on the left. And so if you think about it, there's the developer experience that, you know, what does the developer have to go through on a day-to-day -day basis to get their job done? Then kind of how happy is that developer? And, you know, they may have a really good developer experience, but if they have a terrible boss, they have a terrible organization, they're working on a project that doesn't make any sense, um, they're not gonna be very happy. And, and non-happy people don't do a great job. They don't really spend a bunch of extra time and motivation and, and to desire to be able to get these things done. Then you have to really, re you have to take out the waste and friction from the organization. And that goes from all different levels. You know, it's easy to, to look at kind of the technology pieces of that and saying, oh, well, if, I had a, if I had better pipelines or whatever, but I would make an argument that most of, most of the challenges that a developer faces are all, almost all organizational. You know, for anybody that is, you know, excited enough to try safe, you'll find out how much waste and friction you can inject into your, into your ecosystem and get almost nothing for it. And then the interesting one is the collaboration. So you know, if you take all of that stuff already, and then that multiplier really is the collaboration that it takes to be able to operate inside of the ecosystem. So you know, if they can't find information, they can't do any of those things, like how, does it, how can they really work? And that can be a positive number, it can also be a negative number if they have a really good organization with really good people, it can make your life better, it can make you faster. But if, if you don't have that kind of organization, kind of down to the bottom here with the people process and technology problems, like most organizations are a mess. And you know, the funny thing is, is everybody wants to focus on the technology. And then, you know, that's the easy thing. If you talk to developers and ask any of them, 
do you need another tool to get your job done? Almost every one of them is going to tell you no. They don't need another tool. What they need is better process. They need better interactions. They need better everything else that, that makes their life a little bit easier and not just some other tool to be able to, to add in to the sea of other tools that they have to work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So you know, even when you think about a really optimized organization, it can get incredibly complex. And when I wrote this slide, I was like, my gosh, I can hardly fit it on one slide. But, and this is an optimized world. You know, you have your developer and they want to create something new, so they go to their dev, dev portal. And, okay, great, I can get a starter kit and, you know, create my new Java microservice and it spits out what I need. But then I need to get my IDE set up. Then, I, okay, well, I've got that set up, but now I need to go figure out what libraries and dependencies and all these other things that I need. Then, you know, from a pipeline perspective, how do I actually go and do that? So even in the best world, if I've, I have a platform engineering, I've got a really nice kind of CLI to work with, but there's all these underlying tools. How do I understand it? How do I get feedback? How do I actually deploy this thing? How do I do blue-green blue -green deployments or canary deployments? How do I understand any of those things? And you know, it's a huge challenge, because it's really, really complex, even if it's optimized. And so when you have any of these questions, what do you do? It's a problem. So, you know, again, they pick up the phone, they start calling other people, they send emails, Slack messages, set up meetings, because everybody loves that, and they end up breaking the flow of a lot of other people around. But they have to, because they need to get their job done. And if they can't get their job done, again, from the productivity, it's like, I've got to get X number of things done. My, you know, whoever's controlling their, their sprints, whether it's Scrum Masters or product people or whatever, I've been told from on high that I have to get this done, so they're gonna do what it takes to make their job, to get their job done. Am I keep hitting the wrong button? No? Come on now. So, all right, there we go. So, you know, what do you need to think about? So really it takes a kind of a different, it takes a different way of thinking, a kind of a new strategic approach, and you know, a lot of people right now are focusing on tools. And, you know, hey, if I just put in Copilot, everything's gonna get better. I'm gonna get this huge production gains and everything's gonna look great. But I've talked to an awful lot of people that said, well, I, I went and bought 3,000 Copilot licenses. And this is no shot against Copilot. Like, it's a great tool. But I went and bought 3,000 licenses and in the end, I've not seen any productivity gains. Well, why? It's because of all of the rest of the stuff that's there, if you have all of this different kind of organizational inertia that you have to get through, that bump in productivity from that tool is not really gonna help. So if you take that next step up, like that's super easy, you take that next step up and start thinking about it from kind of tools plus projects, like thinking about things a little more holistically, you can get some more gains there. But again, you're still doing things one off. It's, oh, well I can do this here, I can build this thing, it's, it's one, 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 one. And you're really not thinking about how do I best build these things out into the future. And that's really where kind of the platforms and system thinking comes in. How do I start to think across these different value streams? How do I start to think about what does it take to get this done and to be able to go and execute against these things? A really great example of this is Threads. So, you know, Meta Threads was built in, I think, four months. Why? Because they had all of these different platforms and systems underneath it. They used the login infrastructure from, um, from Instagram. They used a lot of the same infrastructure that's underneath there. And the only thing they really had to build was the front end and all the things that are associated with it. They didn't need to go rebuild all of this stuff that takes a lot of time and energy and effort. And you know, they've, they've spent a lot of time and energy building these, these kind of platforms and systems. And they're, they're able to now build faster, quicker, better, and iterate on that because they've really thought about it in a different way. So when I think about these kind of different platforms and systems thinking, there's really two major ways, two major different types of categories that you want to think about. There's processes, and then there's also kind of connections. <clears throat> so if you think about processes, you know, things like CI, CD pipelines, all those different types of things, how can I go and optimize this process? It's a unit of value for 
your individual developer. And it's a thing that, you know, it's a lot of technology, and a lot of people like to focus on this. But the second one really here is the connections. And so how do you, how do you better connect, whether it's teams, people, organizations, systems, all of those different things across your ecosystem? How do you start to optimize that in a way that helps connect producers and consumers? And you know, that could end up being, like I said, APIs. It could be people. It could be all kinds of things. Knowledge management is a really good one um, that is not done very well in almost every organization. And it's just kind of what level of bad are you OK with? But you know, if you think about, you know, we did a little bit about the kind of the optimized, but here's kind of what some unoptimized processes can look like. And you know, I think we've all gone through a little bit of this dev set, or DevOps chaos of, you know, we moved away from enterprise architecture and said, you know, you build it, you run it. You bring your own tools. You, you do all of that. You own it all. And it, it honestly turned into chaos. It was incredibly hard to measure. It had incredibly high levels of fragmentation across an ecosystem. So if you think about a large organization that might have 200 teams, even if somehow they all use the exact same programming language, it's probably all done differently. So if you think about you know, moving people around to help solve a problem or to you know, help drive a project forward, it becomes really difficult. And then you also see other groups, you know, it's like, oh, well, I mean, maybe we had a data breach or maybe we had some kind of incident. And so now we've locked everything down. We've got manual tickets. We've got stage gates. We've got all this stuff that is going to stop anything bad from happening. And, you know, what does that bring? Like, it's easy to measure. <laughs> What does that bring? It brings you 189 days to get something into production. And it becomes really, really challenging for developers to actually get their job done. You know, the 120, 120 uh, uh, cloud intake. So how do you think about some of that? So you know, value stream mapping is an incredibly valuable tool. If you, as you're thinking about you know, processes, anything across your kind of software delivery lifecycle, and you know, being able to understand how a thing actually works, talk to the people that are actually doing it, and see where that waste is. It's, you know, it seems like an incredibly easy tool, but the, the output of it is incredibly valuable. And you can find very quickly, you know, as you kind of, you can look at this at a, at a high level and build these kind of value streams, you can look at it really quickly and find areas of problems you know, whether it's onboarding. Like, onboarding is always a really big one. I mean, people spend weeks and weeks onboarding sometimes, you know. And it might come down to your code base is just really complex. Your ecosystem is really complex. All of these different things. And if you start to actually gather some of that feedback, kind of the qualitative feedback, but also this kind of, um, this kind of analysis can really bring a lot of value to everything. So, you know, if you think about the other side of, you know, kind of these optimized processes. So if you, you know, kind of on the platform engineering side, okay, you optimize the process. Well, you've now, in a lot of areas, what do they do? They remove kind of the team ownership. It's like, oh, well, we need to optimize our pipelines. So we're going to have a central pipeline team that's going to go do everything. And you're going to provide you with everything. Well, that's a pretty big challenge, too, because in the end, you know, Developers and engineering teams need to be able to operate. They need to be able to do a lot of these things. And you need to be able to retain those levels of ownership. And there's come to really interesting ways of being able to kind of split these things apart, but you need to be able to measure them. And I mean, I could talk a lot about this, this too, but you know, the key here is really being able to measure it and continue to optimize. Like, you know, whether it's splitting up your CAD pipelines, whether it's doing code provenance, whether it's doing any of those things, you know, centralized kind of policy with that federated um, control, but it's still allowing the teams to be able to own and um, leverage the tools that are out there. This thing is not my friend. So now we jump over to the kind of the failure of these organizational connections. So we had the process side, and then we had the, the, um, um, the connection side. And I talked about this a little bit, but you know, when a person has a question, what do they do? They pick up the phone. You know, we're not in the office anymore, so the drive-bys don't happen. But that was always a thing. Like, you can see somebody wandering around just looking for somebody to talk to. And, you know, there's the, I should have put it up here, but there's a few different memes of the, you know, the guy, and then there's a girl, too, that has the little, you know, paper on the back of their chair, like, please don't bother me. I'll talk to you for two hours, and I won't get my job done. 
you know, like it's wasting your two hours, it's wasting their two hours, and it's a big problem that people really need to understand. And so platforms can really help with a lot of this. So, you know, whether it's a kind of developer portal, whether it's a, there's a bunch of different tools out there now, but thinking about it from that platforms and systems perspective, how do we start to funnel these problems and questions and comments and just the needs of the developer community into that single pane of glass? It's like, oh, well, if I have a problem, if I have an issue, I know exactly where I at least can start. And that's the challenge, you know, if you think about that last slide, that person didn't even know where to start. It's like, I have a question, I have a problem, I'm just gonna start pinging people until they point me in the right direction. Or even worse, like, I can go spend 30 or 40 minutes reading through Confluence documents that doesn't ever actually give me the answer, or give me an answer that I trust. And, you know, that's always an issue. And so being able to provide that level of platform and then be able to structure kind of that data underneath the hood is really one of the big keys towards driving a better developer experience and getting them to kind of understand, um, you know, you're trying to drive efficiency. So, you know, thinking about, you know, that, that kind of platform, you know, everybody wants to talk about AI, so I had to as well. But, you know, there's, there's ways of, you know, as you start to centralize those things, you start to have a little bit of structured data you start to have a, way, a place where you can start to inject AI. Um, and the, you know, one of the keys there is to, you know, you have to be able to build that kind of hive mind. And the, you know, that, that hive mind, there's a couple of interesting things. Like, I don't know if anybody checked out Unblocked, who's one of the sponsors. You know, they, they, they seem to do a really good job of being able to take and remove chaos from a very chaotic system. You know, oh, I can connect to your Confluence. I can connect to GitHub. I can connect to all of these different things and be able to kind of pull that together. That's great. And that'll help solve some of your immediate problems, but that to me is, is a bit of a Band-Aid. And you're not actually trying to, so you're not actively trying to solve the problem in the background. Like, yes, like a tool like that's great. I have not had a chance to check that tool out so I cannot talk about its validity, but they have an interesting concept. But, you know, back to kind of the platform and you know, whether it's developer portals like Backstage or Port or a couple others that are out there, having a really good kind of service catalog and taxonomy is going to really, really help your developer experience. Can I understand the things that are out there? And, you know, when you think of a lot of those questions, that's, a, that's what a lot of it is. What are my dependencies? You know, what, what, where can I find this type of data? Those types of things. I was working at an e-commerce company not too long ago. And a whole group had completely rebuilt a second version of something that already existed. They spent like five months on it because they didn't know that this other siloed group had built the exact same thing. And guess what? Both of them were terrible. And if they would have spent the time working together or at least known that they existed, they could have probably built a really good, really good tool, but they didn't. And we've actually been helping them try to stand up a developer portal, pull these things together. Like, hey, here's a set of documentation. Here's, here's some structure around your domains and services and systems and all the other things that you would expect. Um, but you know, the key there is to be able to pull all that stuff together and have some kind of knowledge management to be able to drive you forward. You, know, you cannot expect AI to be able to sift through God knows how many thousands and thousands of pages of confluence from a 100-year-old bank. It's just not going to happen. So what else can you do to leverage your platform? So, you know, there's, I'm sure we've all seen this kind of square before, but, you know, there's the kind of the known knowns and the non -own no, no, ugh, and the known unknowns. And that is a, you know, that's a really big area where that's where you should be spending your time automating, injecting AI tools, like spending, like, that getting rid of a lot of those kinds of things, you know, if you're, um, if you have a really good platform and you're using Kubernetes, like look at a tool like Kubia that can answer some really interesting questions around your deployments and other things and build that into your, into your kind of developer portal to give access to your developers or even better, maybe have a, get it injected into your CLI or build a plugin for your IDE. But, you know, give, like make those things easy if you're a developer, you should not be spending an awful lot of your time on 
that top row. You should be spending all of your time on the bottom row. That's the thing that has the most impact to your business. The things that you don't know anything about that are gonna come bite you, that's when you get a phone call at two o'clock in the morning because you've had a service outage. And so if you're, if you're you know, thinking about you know, your developer experience and back to that kind of formula that I put together, is your developer happy if you're calling them all weekend because things are broke? Probably not. And it's the, those bottom two rows that are really causing a lot of that. So if you can minimize those top two, focus on the bottom two, that's really where you're gonna start getting a ton of value and be able to you know, make people a little bit happier to come into work the next day. So you know, how do you build this kind of continuous improvement, uh, you know, just kind of culture overall? Honestly, it's really not super hard, but it's a lot harder than people might imagine. You know, kind of starting on the left, we already talked a little bit about value stream mapping, but another really big key is the kind of quantitative and qualitative data. Do surveys, talk to your, talk to your developers. Very rarely have I met a developer or development teams that can't point you to exactly where the problems are. The problem is that nobody's ever asked them. And if they've told people, they haven't listened. And you know, being able to get that data set, that data foundation that I talked about earlier, really is the key towards identifying these hotspots. And you, know, you may not be able to tackle them all, but you know, it goes back to the, you know, when's the best time to plant a tree? 25 years ago. Second best times today. And so if you can build this kind of continuous culture, that's the way that you're going to constantly keep improving your developer experience little by little. And by identifying those kind of hotspots, working with the teams to be able to understand and kind of assess these different solutions of is this thing actually going to make things better? Um, you know, another interesting thing there is, you know, you can't actually make your developer experience worse if you try hard enough. And injecting another tool just might do that. You know, simplification is, is one of the big keys that really talking about now. But the next thing is really around you know, building out what's that value model. I've talked to you know, a lot of different executives and they're, they're coming around, but a lot of them are still looking at developer experience as an expense and not, an, not as an investment. And so one of the big things is how do you start to calculate those savings and cost savings that says, oh, well, this developer spends half their day waiting. And if they're waiting, that means they're probably doing nothing you know, had another interesting chat with, a, with somebody yesterday. They're like, I have a thousand developers and I'm pretty sure only 400 of them are actually doing something. He had just taken over the organization and he was doing a quick analysis. And it's like, well, there's a very good chance, but you, know, you need to be able to build that cost model and build those kind of leading and lagging metrics to understand it, measure the outcome, and then iterate on it. It takes pretty good, or at least product mindset and product thinking to be able to kind of drive those things forward. And I mean, I've already beaten on this a bunch, but you know, listen to your developers. You know, they, they will tell you what these problems are. And there's a lot of really great tools out there to, um, to be able to help with this. You know, I'm a bit biased, I'm going to work for DX, but they have a really great survey platform. Um, but there are other, other tools out there that do a great job. But you don't have to start with tool. You can start with a Google form or Microsoft form or whatever. Just get their feedback in one way or another. Because there's, you know, there is waste and friction across there that you're really gonna struggle with. Because in the end, you need to convince your, your developers that that light at the end of the tunnel is not another train coming to run them over. It's light, and it doesn't take a lot. Like, if, if, you, if you give them a little bit of time, a little bit of energy, a little bit of space to be able to improve their experience overall through time, you're gonna have higher retention rates. You're gonna have People are gonna be happier. You're gonna just, the, the mood of the engineering organization is going to be much better. But if you think that it's another train coming to run you over, they're all just one job offer away from leaving. And, you know, I haven't looked up the stat before today, but I think it's something around you know, approximately 250% of their um, salary is what it costs to replace them. And, you know, why they leave? A lot of times it's just because it's a bad, bad experience. So, you know, Nicole, I think, does a great job with this kind of quote. And you know, developer experience is all about finding ways to improve productivity, but it's also about injecting joy into their day-to-day -day job and just decreasing overall frustration. And you know, that developer happiness really can't be understated in a lot of ways. So 
you know, in the end, a lot of people want to focus on kind of that developer productivity, but the way that you actually do developer experience, it's not some kind of black magic. It's by focusing on the things that are hard, unfortunately. There's no silver bullet that's gonna stop a lot of this. There's no any of those pieces. But if you focus on improving their day-to-day -day life, you're gonna have really good productivity gains. And guess what? The other tools like Copilot, you're gonna get a lot better gains out of them because they're not gonna be spending their time wasting. They're spending more time actually writing code. And so thank you very much. It was a pleasure getting a chance to chat with you. Anybody have any, uh, any questions? Yay, there we go. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for the speaker? Okay. Um, so thanks, Chris. Yeah, uh, yeah so in, in your talk, you walked us through um, many uh, abstractions. Yeah. Um, for instance, the quadrant of uh, different types of knowns, unknowns, um, value stream mapping, so on. Um, I was curious if uh, you had any uh, case study uh, where you can walk through um, yeah, many of these like, high-level abstractions that you introduced. Okay. So, you know, so I would say that like, platform engineering is, is that that's the whole concept around platform engineering really helps with a lot of this. So if you think about those kind of known unknowns, everything else, it's all about how do you start to deliberately set things up. So if you think about observability, if you think about kind of tracing and monitoring and all of these other things, if, if you have tools around that and they make it easy for people to use, like that's the way you can do it. Well, how do you actually deliver on some of that? It's through good platform engineering in my opinion. So there's, you have your developer portals, things like backstage, Port, um, Compass, uh, Cortex, those types of folks. But then you have your kind of internal developer portals, things like Humanitech um, that are more around kind of being that kind of platform orchestration layer. Well, you really need a, you know, your platform should have some kind of, kind of face to it, right? It's, whether a lot of times you see it as a CLI, but you, you need, so as you start to build those different tools, thinking about ways of like, how do you meet the developer where they are to give them that, but then having a, taking a product mindset to those things and figuring out how to do it. So, you know, take an example of, like I talked about um, SonarCube, where they just stood it up and threw it out there and said, good luck, everybody. Like, if you were to, if you were to think about that differently, a better way to do that is, you know, having, whether it's a product person, a technical product person or whatever, a person that owns that platform, and they should be thinking about the configuration. They should be thinking about how do I, how do I make this easy to use? How do I get feedback back to the developers? And how can I make that all pretty seamless? Well, the way you can do that, or the way that I, some of the best ways that I've seen do that is you know, inside of your kind of platform CLI, or if you've built a UI, that's great too. You know, instead of directly calling the Sonar Cube's API, build an abstraction and say, oh, well, I, I want a static code analysis is what I want, regardless if it's Sonar Cube or somebody else. Be able to then build a, a plugin inside of your developer portal to say, okay, well, in my pipeline, I can call this thing through a CLI. Then I can provide feedback into my developer portal to give them the information that they're looking for. And you've now built a really good experience to give people the information they need when they need it, if they need it. And you know, that kind of structure works for almost, almost anything out there. Like, how do I make it easy to use? How do I provide people feedback? How do I um, you know, meet them where they are? And that's, like, that's, that's really it. I mean, I could rattle off 10 to more examples, but I'm not sure that's the best use of time. Thanks. Um, so yeah, in this specific case of SonarCube, right, uh, you, it's obvious that it is for static code analysis. Mm -hmm. Yes. However, it seems more of a culture issue, a management issue, and yeah, the, do people who are using this tool or setting up this tool do they have to really be aware of these uh, abstractions? Yeah, in, in order to uh, introduce this tool in such an efficient manner. Yeah. So the you know the 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 way that you should be like. 
there's a lot of people that look at a tool like that and say, well, I want to check the box and say, okay, well, I'm doing static code analysis. Yay. But what you actually should be doing is the thing that, the, the thing that a, a developer or development team cares about is the vulnerabilities and everything else that they found. And that's the problem you're actually trying to solve. You can do that through SonarCube. But I would suggest that if that's the, like, that's the problem, you know, do we want them to actually understand the intricacies of how to use SonarCube? Maybe, maybe not. Like, I would suggest no. <laughs> Make it easy for them to use and then give them back information to be able to, to then go operate on. Still give them information, but take away that complexity. So if you think about in the, in the DevSecOps tool chain, there's, there could be 20 different things in there now, especially if you start adding in things like code provenance and everything else and SBOMs. And, like, you can, you can start to have a gigantic list of tools that you need to know in a deep level, well, you shouldn't necessarily have to do that. If you can take and make that easier and say, the thing that I need you to know is instead of understanding the deep API for SonarCube, we did all that work for you. What I want you to do is use this CLI command, give me this, this type of configuration with these parameters, and that's it. And then here's the, here's the report that you get back. You don't need to understand the complexity. I've, I've solved that problem. The, the problem you're actually interested in isn't understanding SonarCube. It's how do I remove um, vulnerabilities from my application? And so that, you know, that type of model makes it easier for you to do your job without having to withstand the cognitive load of trying to manage all of these different problems. Because you know, if, there's, if there's 10 different tools inside of your tool chain, it can be really difficult to understand exactly what these things mean. Or a case like SonarCube or other tools, like, you can get back 50 vulnerabilities. Which one of those actually matter? You know, is this, do I have to get all of them? Is, 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 is it, you know, where on the severity scale do I stop? Like those are all questions that become a big challenge for a developer. And the answer is like, this, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have to care about that. Someone in architecture or in leadership or whatever should be making the decision that says we are willing to take the risk of you know, all the low vulnerabilities or whatever. Like, and that's, that, it takes more away from you and again, lets you focus on the things that matter. Okay, well of that 50, the only thing that I care about is these three and there's this one that is gonna stop me from deploying to production. And that's all managed through tools like OPA and everything else that go along with it and having that kind of, um, you know, kind of governance as code. And so it makes your life a lot easier as a developer and it takes away all that, that complexity. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. It was a pleasure to get to chat with you all, and hopefully enjoy the rest of your afternoon.